welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, Karen Pearl. She's the Chief Executive Officer and President of God's Love We Deliver. And Karen, I understand you've been at the helm of God's Love We Deliver for the last 15 years. Would you explain to our audience exactly what you do? Sure. God's Love We Deliver is based in New York City, and we cook and home deliver medically tailored meals to people who are so sick that they can't take care of themselves or their families if they have families. So people who are living with up to 200 different diagnoses from cancer to AIDS to uh, kidney failure, heart failure, any number of different diagnoses and often multiple diagnoses. So about 40% of our clients actually have four or more diagnoses. So they're very sick and they really need help taking care of their most basic need which is nutrition. And I've read that the meals are all medically cared and provided for, meaning that they are specifically tailored for each patient. Is that correct? That is correct. So every one of our clients meets with a, diet, with a registered dietitian nutritionist. And through that assessment, they figure out based on the person's diagnosis or multiple diagnoses, their illness, their um, medications, side effects, allergies, any number of very specific things related to their medical situation, then they can figure out what the right meal is for them or meals for them. And then in collaboration between our registered dietitians and our kitchen, those meals get designed and then ultimately cooked, packaged, and delivered. And how many meals do you send out every year? Every year we do 2.5 million meals this year and growing. So every year we're adding more and more meals because more and more people are learning about God's love and need us. You are a big operation and you're doing a lot of great work. Now you provide meals for the five boroughs of New York. Is that exactly correct? We provide meals in the five boroughs of New York City and then also into Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, and Hudson County, New Jersey. And I understand you have a very large network of volunteers. How many do you have? And, and then how do you get them? God's love is so lucky. We have 17,000 volunteers a year who help us. They work largely in our operations, kitchen, meal packaging, and delivery. But they also work in all of our offices, and they are invaluable. We literally could not do our work without them. We're a kind of, in, rel in relative numbers, 17,000 volunteers. We're kind of a small staff. All together, we're less than 150 people. And uh, we need the help. We need the, the great hearts and the wonderful hands of people who really want to help take care of their most vulnerable neighbors, those who are living with severe illness and really can't take care of their own needs. And what is it about God's love we deliver that attracts so many volunteers? Because I would think for a charity of your size to, to get 17,000 volunteers, you have to be doing something very special. I think we are, I, I will say that. And what we are doing that is special is a couple of things. One is every time people show up, they have meaningful work. Nobody's ever sitting around wasting their time. The second thing that we do is we treat our volunteers very well. They have a beautiful space on our, in our new building. There's a terrace that they can sit on. We have snacks and coffee and tea and water so that they can be nourished themselves before and after shifts. Uh, and we also welcome people as often as they want to come. So we have volunteers who come three, four times a week. We have volunteers who come once a year. And that's okay with us. We don't ask people for a lifetime commitment. We don't ask people to pick a shift and never switch. We understand people go on vacation. So we create an environment where we treat our volunteers 
much as we treat our clients with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. And we are so grateful for their help that we will work with them to make it work for them. So if somebody says, you know, I really want to, I love working in a kitchen. I want to keep working in your kitchen, but the shift doesn't work out for me. Okay, we'll switch. So I think we create a great and rewarding volunteer experience and people keep coming back. And no question you've created an excellent model for other charities to follow. Mm -hmm. And in my book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give, I devote a chapter to a treatment of volunteers, paid employees, and those you serve. And if you don't treat your volunteers well, and you don't treat those that you serve well, and you don't treat your staff well, and you don't treat those that fund you well, well, you're going to have a problem. So I love what you're doing. I love that you're taking your volunteers and treating them with dignity and respect. Now, I want to go back to your beginnings. I read that God's Love We Delivered began in 1985, and it started by, it was started by one woman. Tell us a little bit about that. So the woman who started God's Love is a woman whose name is Ganga Stone. Unfortunately, Ganga just passed away two days ago. So we are um, remembering her and honoring her legacy and celebrating her life because it was quite a remarkable life. And she got started. She was a hospice volunteer. She was delivering food to somebody who was dying of AIDS at the time, a man by the name of Richard Sale. And Ganga put the groceries on the counter. They had a great conversation. She left. So she went in to check on him the next day. And the groceries were still sitting on the counter. And he was mad. And he was mad because he said, I am so sick. What do you expect me to do with those groceries? I can't stand up and cook. And she had that light bulb moment that said, when people are that sick, what they need is a meal. A meal that looks delicious, smells delicious, because we tend to eat with our eyes. We tend to eat with our noses, but long before the food ever reaches our mouth. So Ganga said, okay, we're gonna start bringing people who are sick meals. And she started with Richard and then another person, another person, another person, and it got to be a lot. And she realized she couldn't do it by herself. So she enlisted, she took people's date books, which at the time, you know, address books used to be in paper and she'd flip through it and she'd start calling people. So she called Jean and say, Jean, I'm at Richard's house. He needs food tomorrow. Can you be the person who brings him food tomorrow? And that's what started us as a voluntary organization. People helping neighbors. Sometimes they knew their neighbor. Sometimes they didn't know. Because when AIDS got to really spread, it couldn't just be somebody in your address book. It had to be just all these people coming together. And it was an extraordinary act of courage for people at that time to go to people's homes with AIDS. But we got our name because one day Ganga was walking down the street carrying bags of meals and a minister that she knew stopped her and said, Ganga, I see you all the time carrying all this stuff. What are you doing? And she said, I'm delivering meals to somebody who's dying of AIDS. And the minister said, now remember this is back in the eighties when people with HIV were shunned and were pushed aside and forgotten. And the minister said, Ganga, you're not delivering food meals. You're delivering God's love. And she said, that's the name. So from that story, she said, our name is going to be God's Love We Deliver. Because she wanted people to know that they were loved. And that there, were a lot, there was a whole community who was going to help care for them. And that's a beautiful story. And I'm so sorry that she passed away this week. And of course, we must all pay tribute to this woman who's done so much good for so many people in New York. And Karen, of course, you've carried on her um, legacy, so to speak, in that you're running this fantastic operation. And now, are you a religious charity? No, we are not. I know our name is confusing to people that way. Uh, we are um, not religious, not sectarian, but we are, in fact, um, very much about love and about spirit and about taking care of people. And so, you know, we've learned to live with the name for people who find it confusing. Uh, but most people, once they hear the story, figure it out and they say, oh, that's, that makes a lot of sense given the timing. 
Now, I wanted to go back to the COVID-19 pandemic. How did you operate at the height of the pandemic? And did you lose your volunteers? Did you lose your funding? What happened exactly? Yeah, the pandemic was pretty insane. I mean, literally overnight, the safety net under people just disappeared. And food is a pretty important part of that safety net in New York City in particular. And our phones started ringing. We got phone calls initially from 3,500 people who wanted to be fed by God's love. And we just did everything that we could to like throw resources at it. So a couple of things, because of the uh, reductions in the numbers of people who were allowed to be in buildings, even though we were essential workers. So our kitchen operated 100%, meal packaging, delivery, volunteers, 100% facilities, more than 100%. That's an, another story. But we had to figure out how to transition everybody to work at home otherwise. So all of our client recruitment and intake and nutrition assessment all started to happen remotely. Uh, we, over time, brought on 6,000 new individuals. We had a 30% increase in our, um, in the numbers of people who were counting on us. We did crazy amounts of sanit sanitizing the building from, you know, hand sanitizer. I put my hand out because it's, it's everything drops in it, you know, the little from hand sanitizing to wiping everything down. We hired temporary people in facilities to clean the bathrooms more often, clean all of the public spaces more often. Um, and we then had to put in place masking and social distancing, which really affected our operations. So you asked about our volunteers, many of our longtime volunteers who um, for, for any number of reasons could not come in. And so it was an opportunity to find new volunteers who were actually at home with lots of time on their hands and looking for something meaningful and purposeful. So we were able to fill all of our volunteer spots and to really rise to meet the incredible challenge. Uh, and many of that's still in place. Even though COVID is re relaxing in a lot of places, at God's love, we are still masked, we are still gloved, we are still sanitizing because we're serving the most vulnerable population from a health perspective. And I love hearing that you're still being very, very careful because with this pandemic, although it appears as if it's leaving us, and I'm hoping and praying that it Me is. Too. Uh, we never really know for sure. So I think it's always good to be extra careful, especially when you're providing meals to those who are home uh, with severe illness. Now, Karen, you have a history of putting together fabulous uh, charity events, events to raise money. Mm -hmm. And what did you do during the pandemic? How could you raise money? And what are you doing moving forward? So a couple of different things there. One is that the city realized and people realized, the city by that I mean the government, and the people realized that there were so many vulnerable people who were without food and the right food and adequate food. And so the city council did a number of significant grants to God's love and many of the other food providers, not just to God's love, to really help us do what we needed to do. So for example, we wanted to make sure that during COVID, nothing would interfere with our ability to deliver. And we didn't know what that could be. Who knew what was gonna happen? So we spent without even thinking because of that grant, without even questioning what we were gonna do, about $280,000 to do a week's worth of shelf stable food and get it delivered to every single client. So that if in fact their delivery was interrupted, they had food and they did not have to panic. And we've actually now done that three times during the year and few months of COVID. We're actually doing another bag right now. That's more um, like still COVID, but also in case people lose electricity and their food goes bad, we wanna make sure people have food. So that's uh, one of the ways we help in the summer. So um, it, we did everything we could um, from a fundraising perspective to really not only take care of our clients with the extra funds, but to your point earlier, really thank the donors who stood with us and who made it possible for us to keep going without missing one day of delivery during the entire pandemic, without 
missing any clients, really doing everything we can. So from an events perspective, what do we do? Our gala went virtual and was pretty successful. Uh, our race went totally virtual. Uh, and so some people, everybody ran whatever route they wanted to run. And what was the silver lining in that is families, let's say that somebody works at God's love, but their brother lives in Wyoming. Their brother in Wyoming could do the race because it was all virtual. You had to find your four mile course, go do it. You're in the race. So that was really wonderful. And then um, we're not doing the Hamptons this year, unfortunately, because people just aren't quite ready for that yet. We have an alternative plan, which we can talk about. Uh, so we've done a number of different events. And then last night, we had our Love Rocks NYC concert at the Beacon. So it was our first coming back into the world event. And um, we filled the seats with people who bought sponsorship packages, but it was a hybrid event. We did a live stream of the entire concert on the web for free so that everybody could join us. And that was really exciting. So like my family, which lives on the two coasts, but not in New York, they all watched. And it was really fun. Everybody's saying, oh, I'm hearing from so-and-so. Um, so it was great. And the concert itself was spectacular. So it was a great, it's, we're, we're easing in, we're trying to figure out events, hybrid, in-person, but they won't be 100% virtual anymore, except maybe the race. I don't know, that will be up to the New York Roadrunners. And how many people were actually at the Be Beacon Theater? And then how much money did you raise? It was about 800 people at the Beacon Theater, and it will be about three and a half million dollars when it's all over. Which is very significant for very a fundraising significant. event. And and how did you protect the 800 people at the Beacon Theater? Did they have to show proof of a vaccination or, or a 72-hour or yeah. COVID test? Or what yeah. did you do exactly? So the Beacon actually is operated by Madison Square Garden, and it's their rules. Uh, so to sit in the our orchestra, uh, you had to show proof of vaccination. And if you either didn't have proof or you didn't want to show proof or whatever, um, you could sit up and you had to be masked if you sat up. So, and there were people who paid attention to that. There was security who made sure that people were masked. And then in any of the public spaces, like the lobby, the ladies room, the men's room, whatever, you had to be masked up as well. So it felt pretty safe actually. And, and then we had food, but you took your box, your individual box, and you brought it to your seat. And you sat with your hopefully vaccinated friend. I don't mean hopefully, hopefully everybody who came had vaccinated friends with them. Yes, all very interesting. And uh, last night I happened to be at the New York Botanical Gardens Gala mm -hmm. and similar rules. We all had to either show proof of vaccination or a 72 hour test. And people did not wear masks at the event. I brought one just in case, and it was a great success. So we see New York City is really opening up, and I think that's a great thing. The event I was at was in an outdoor open-ended tent, so there was a lot of air coming in. Yeah. Now, getting back to God's Love We Deliver, what kind of annual budget do you have? Our budget's about $25 million dollars. Probably this coming year, which for us starts July 1, it'll be a little bit more than that. Because of our model, which is the medically tailored meal model, we have to buy all of our food because we have to have, again, the proper food for the person who's getting it. So we can't rely on whatever might come in through the door. We do get a lot of food donations, but they go to our volunteers who love it. Uh, and we, uh, so we, we purchase our food. That's a significant part of our budget. We have to have vehicles that are out on the road delivering, you know, pay for gas, pay for car insurance, all of that. Um, so most of our budget goes into the people who work at God's Love and the operations. And then your overhead, I think it must be low. I, I was on the internet and saw that you had a rating from GuideStar. And I think it was a very good rating. From Charity Navigator. It is. Navigator. It's, it's the highest rating. It's a four-star rating. Four, five-star, five-star rating, I think it is. Um, but it, we're very fortunate. We're one of, of very, very few, like less than 10% of charities in the United States who have had that for more than seven years. So we're proud of that. 
And as you should be. And now if our viewers want to volunteer, is there a process that you have to go through? Do you vet the volunteers? I would imagine you do, but how do you go about becoming a volunteer? So our biggest vetting is age because most of our volunteers do work in our kitchen and there's some pretty dangerous knives in there. So we only allow people who are of majority to volunteer in the kitchen unless they're supervised by another adult, like a, a parent. Um, but other than that, we actually don't really vet volunteers. We really believe that uh, the work that we do, as I said, really counts on the people who volunteer with us. Um, and so we welcome people and we teach you what you need to know. We'll teach you knife skills. We'll teach you food safety skills. We'll teach you whatever it is you need to know. Um, if you don't want to work with knives, you know, with, there's dishing that goes on in the kitchen. You don't have to ever pick up a knife. You can ladle or you whatever. Um, or you can work in meal packaging, which is where we package every individual person's bag that, that they're getting. So the bag, let's say for Eugene, would say, it wouldn't say your name. It has a code for your name. Um, and then it says, you know, you get a regular meal on Monday, a modified meal on Tuesday, a special meal on Wednesday. Your dessert is sometimes regular. Your soup is sometimes So So what, whatever you need, that's what goes into your bag. And that all goes by route. Um, and then it goes out on a van. And we have van assistants who drive along with our drivers and who help make the deliveries, which we always appreciate. And for our Viewers, we are with Karen Pearl. She is the Chief Executive Officer and President of God's Love We Deliver. And she's now explaining how you can become a volunteer at God's Love We Deliver. They have 17,000 volunteers. They treat their volunteers with dignity and respect. And for our viewers, this may be the perfect opportunity for you to add being a volunteer to what you do. And you know, when you give, you get, it's extremely re rewarding to give. And I can't think of a better way to get involved in the philanthropic process than to volunteer. And Karen, for those watching, what is the website uh, to learn about volunteer opportunities and, and the website to donate? Because I think a lot of people viewing this show will want to donate what you do is incredible. You have low overhead. You have an excellent rating um, in the United States as charities go. And actually, you're, you're doing everything right. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. So our website is godslovewedeliver.org. If you not, don't want to write all that out, it's just G-L-W-D, God's Love We Deliver, glwd.org. You can go there to volunteer. You can go there to donate. You can go there to get educated because we have a lot of nutrition information. We have nutrition guides by different illnesses. Uh, there's our history. There's how do you become a client? There's a lot of information there. So um, our website is pretty uh, robust and we invite you to come and learn more about us and to donate. Of course, we love that and to volunteer. And then the third role that we ask of people who get to know the organization is to be an ambassador. If you know people who need our services, let us know. If you know of other friends who are a little bored, they don't know what to do with themselves, bring them along on a volunteer shift. Maybe they end up loving it too. Um, and so there are lots and lots of ways to be involved between those three different roles. And I think it's so exciting. And I know for me personally, my involvement with several different charities has really opened up a life for me that I would otherwise not have. And uh, for those watching this show, you become a philanthropist by donating your time, by giving knowledge, and then of course you give your available resources. And for those who have ample resources, well, I believe we have an obligation to give. And remember each act of kindness, each act of sharing, well, it just makes you a more complete, and, and, and more content person. Mm -hmm. And Karen, as we conclude uh, this interview, are there any parting words you wanna leave with our audience? I would say that the most important thing is to find something in the not-for-profit world that gives you pleasure. Whether it's God's love we deliver, and I surely hope that it is, um, but it's a world where 
all organizations really need help. And what we do we, is life-saving. It's bringing hope and dignity and um, nourishment to people who otherwise don't have it. But, you know, some people would rather read to kids. That's great. Some people would rather do other things. And so whatever it is, but um, there will be an organization that needs you. And it's, you know, we invite you again for that to be God's love. But if not, I just, you know, on behalf of all of my colleagues in the not-for-profit world, I just invite people to get involved because it is, as you just said, you really do get more than you give. No question. And Karen, you run an extraordinary charity, God's Love We Deliver. And finally, I want to ask one other question. Do you ever get to rest? <laughs> it sounds like you're working 24-7. I don't, I do not work 24 seven. I work very hard, but I love it. And it gives me lots of energy and I wouldn't trade it for anything. And Karen, I must say it is a great pleasure to interview you because you are a real philanthropic leader, a woman who's taken on a big job for one of New York City's top food insecurity uh, charities, and I hope that's the right way to say it, or a charity that helps those that um, live with a severe illness at home. And I love the work you're doing. And finally, would you give the website once more? Sure. glwd.org. Karen, you do a great job, and it certainly seems like you work 24-7. This concludes Successful Philanthropy, our guest today, Karen Pearl, she's the CEO and president of God's Love We Deliver. I'm Jean Shafferoff, your host. I'll see you next week.